Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are returning to Ridley Scott's Exodus, Gods and Kings. Now obviously, as this is the second part, it's probably a good idea to listen to the first half first, but, well, ultimately, do what you want, I guess. (laughs) Before we dive right in, there are actually some interesting facts about this film. Firstly, according to Ridley Scott, there was actually an uncut version of this film that was over four hours hours long. However, it was never released. Now, this may sound a little bit insane to be honest, but I would actually be up for seeing this. I kind of hinted at why in the last episode, but I'll get into it more in this one. Essentially, it comes down to the fact that I think the story here is suitable for that kind of length, especially when portrayed in this kind of epic style. And don't get me wrong, not many films are, but I do think that this one is an exception. Though, considering there is this, um, you know, four-hour cutout there, it's kind of impressive that this whole film was shot in just 74 days. I mean, that's less than three months to shoot a full blockbuster. Seriously impressive when you consider other big blockbusters. Um, Let's take uh, Avengers Endgame, for instance. That film took over five months to shoot. Anyway, um, in terms of the format for this episode, first there will be a section on the historical accuracy. This mainly is going to focus on the, you know, the Battle of Kadesh in the film, as there's a lot to talk about in the scene. And then I shall, you know, finish off my review of the film and rate it out of 10. But before then, as usual, it is time for our dramatic intro. Right, you are the son of the pharaoh the mighty Seti I. By your side is a man you have grown up with, a man you consider a brother, even though he is not your own flesh and blood. His name is Moses, and it is clear that he is destined for great things. All seems well, but then your father starts acting coldly towards you. It is clear he favours Moses. It is obvious that he would rather Moses be his real son. Worse still, you fear that he has plans to give him the throne. In order to secure your position, you find out about Moses' past, and soon realise he is actually the son of a slave. As such, you exile him from the kingdom and breathe a sigh of relief, your position secured. However, Little do you realise that this is not the end of your conflict with him. He will return on a mission from the god of his people, bringing about terrible events and plagues. Soon, you will be in a war, which will involve an exodus, gods and kings. Okay, we have now arrived at the historical accuracy of the film. For this episode, as I kind of said earlier, we will mainly focus on the battles, mainly the Battle of Kadesh, looking at the various like weapons and armour shown as well. So, Kadesh in the film is a real place, it was an ancient city in Syria. And I do feel a lot of people would jump at the film, immediately accusing it of inaccuracy for having this battle at all in the film. After all, it claims that the battle took place under the reign of Seti I, when the most famous Battle of Kadesh happened during the reign of Ramesses II, so Seti I's son. Basically, this is one of, uh, or maybe even the most famous battle in ancient Egyptian history. It took place more in the sort of like landscape around the city of Kadesh, but essentially it was um, occupied by the Hittite civilization, who were a civilization who today would have been in sort of like modern-day Turkey. During both the reigns of Seti I and Ramesses II, they were very much considered one of the biggest enemies of the Egyptians. It's actually a really interesting battle for many reasons. Firstly, both sides actually claimed that they won, and this ultimately led to the world's first ever peace treaty. This was, um, unsurprisingly, I guess, between um, Egypt and the Hittites, And believe it or not, it actually lasted right up until the Hittite civilization 
were destroyed about a hundred years later. Finally, Ramesses II almost lost his life during the battle, as he and his guards got surrounded at one point. This is largely the reason I think they are trying to replicate this particular fight in the film, as we do kind of see a scene where Ramesses gets surrounded in this one. And then in this scene, it's actually Moses who ends up rescuing Ramesses. However, as I said, despite this, I am going to give the film the benefit of the doubt a little bit here, because ultimately, Seti also did have a battle at Kadesh, and it does seem likely that Ramesses II was also present at that one as well. Obviously, he wasn't the, the pharaoh at that time, but he was present in the fighting. To give a little bit of context to sort of how these, um, these battles fit into Egyptian history and how they relate to each other as well, um, essentially, Kadesh had been an area that um, sort of, for a large part of the 18th dynasty, had actually been ruled over by Egypt. However, then we arrived at a time period called the Armana period, where there was a very controversial pharaoh who comes up a lot in this podcast called Akhenaten. He's kind of probably best known for creating arguably the first ever monotheistic religion in the world. Essentially, he seemed either hostile or indifferent to the other gods in, in Egypt, and instead solely worshipped the Aten, which was the disc of the sun. Personally, I would argue this is more what we call henotheism, as, well, essentially that's, that's a belief that there are other gods out there, but you're only worshipping one, basically. And I don't think Akhenaten was necessarily trying to disbelieve in the other gods, he just wasn't worshipping them. Either way, I, I definitely think the point's up for debate, and different Egyptologists are going to give you different answers here. At this time, um, Egypt also became incredibly inward-looking, and as such, a lot of the territories outside of Egypt kind of started to, um, to fall away from Egyptian control, and Kadesh was one of these. As such, during the reign of Seti I in the 19th dynasty, one of the things he sort of tried to do was regain a lot of this control and influence. It does look like Seti managed to take back Kadesh. This can sort of be seen in a victory stealer rediscovered at Kadesh in 1921. However, Egypt didn't seem to hold on to the area for that long, hence Ramesses II had to go back there in order to reclaim the location once again. When it comes to the actual battle in the film, well, first thing first, I'm going to guess this is supposed to be the um, the more famous battle of Kadesh, the one that happened during the reign of Ramesses II. So that's the one I'm going to sort of mainly focus on here. But either way, the accuracy is pretty mixed. In fairness, um, when it comes to the Egyptian chariots, the initial look of them actually isn't too bad. They are drawn by two horses, which is correct. Though, if I am being a little bit picky, the horses are a tiny bit too big. Egyptian horses tended to be a bit smaller. There are also two people riding in the chariot, which again is correct. Don't get me wrong, it is fair to say when you look at depictions of chariot riders in, um, you know, uh, wall reliefs and things like that, very often it shows just one person, often the pharaoh himself, both riding the chariot and shooting the bow at the same time. Realistically, though, this, this wouldn't have happened. It would have been one person riding the chariot, whilst another person stood on the chariot shooting a bow. So the film does get this correct. On the downside, though, at the actual battle, they have a large amount of chariots charging at the Hittites' front line, which they then crash into. This isn't how Egyptian chariots worked at all. Typically, they were designed to be small, quick, and light. They would ride forward to a position where they were able to shoot the enemy, and then they would ride away before the enemy could shoot them. That was kind of their purpose. As for the Hittite chariots, most of the ones in the film are drawn by three horses. They too are used to crash into the Egyptian front lines. In reality, most Hittite chariots were actually drawn by two horses as well. But this was not a hard and fast rule. Some Hittite chariots had up to four horses, so I guess it's not out of the realms of possibility they would have three horses. Some may have done, it's just um, maybe not on the level shown in this film. The Hittite chariots in the film also look a lot bigger, heavier, and slower than the Egyptian ones. And again, this is more or less accurate. 
This is because, unlike the Egyptian chariots, they were designed to smash into the enemy, so at least this part is correct. Unfortunately though, regardless of whether we're talking about the Hittites or the Egyptians here, we see a lot of people riding on horseback. This really was not that common this far back. In fact, cavalry of this type did not really become a thing for another few hundred years. I, I think it was the Persians who brought it in. As for other weapons, a lot of the evidence for the Battle of Kadesh comes from various scenes found around Egypt. So scenes of the Battle of Kadesh can be found at Luxor in places like the Ramesseum. So that's Ramesses II's mortuary temple. They can also be found at Abu Simbel near Aswan the place where, earlier in this film, Seti I had his funeral for some reason. If you remember last episode, I, I pointed out that this location was built during the reign of Ramesses II, and in fact the statues outside of it are of Ramesses II, so it really wouldn't have been around during the time of Seti I. Um, anyway, um, depictions of the Battle of Kadesh can also be found at places like Abydos as well. So it's by using the depictions of the battle in these locations that we can get an idea of what kind of weapons were used. During the scene in the film, we don't really see any axes or anything like that, and well, these had been a big part of the Egyptian military for most of Egyptian history. However, in fairness, um, scenes from the Battle of Kadesh do tend to not have them, and it does seem that even during the reign of Ramesses II in general, axes were not used as much as they previously had been, so their absence here is not entirely incorrect. Further to this, the film shows a lot of people using swords. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to guess they did this because, for some reason, swords are just the most exciting weapon when it comes to these kind of films, but also in fairness, um, swords were used at Kadesh. Though, Typically, the most popular type were the curved capresh sword, not the straight one shown in this film. Finally, when it comes to the weapons at least, there are quite a few javelins shown in the film, and, well, once again, they were present at Kadesh. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to the armour shown, there is a whole heap of artistic license here. It is fair to say that there was some body armour um, in Egypt by this point, Typically, this consisted of um, small bronze plates riveted to linen, or also just, you know, like leather jerkins. Certainly, though, nothing as elaborate as shown in the film. Also, it looks like most of the soldiers in the film are wearing helmets, when these were actually incredibly rare. On top of that, the, the helmets shown in the film are just completely wrong in general as well. For instance, Ramesses II is wearing a helmet that looks a little bit like the vulture crown that was supposed to um, represent Necbet. This is a crown typically worn by queens and princesses, and certainly not in battle. <laughs> Realistically, outside of the blue capresh crown that was typically worn by the pharaoh, it would have been pretty rare to see any soldiers wearing helmets at all. Moving away from the Battle of Kadesh, when we are nearing the end of the film, Ramesses starts hanging Hebrew families and vows to keep doing so until Moses comes forward. In all honesty, there isn't actually that much evidence for hangings in ancient Egypt, and certainly not using a gallows as shown in the film. In fact, I could be wrong here, we're going outside of my area of, of expertise, but I don't think these became a thing until Western time, so, <laughs> you know, it's only off by, what, like, uh, well over 3,000 years. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. In fairness, they did have the death penalty in ancient Egypt. However, very often it was done via impalement. They would place the body on top of a wooden stake and then let gravity do the work. There is also some evidence for people being burned alive as well. In other instances, often with high-ranking individuals, they would not necessarily suffer capital punishment, but they would strongly be encouraged to, you know, take their own lives. One example of this would be Pentuer, the son of Ramesses III. He was involved in what is known as the Harim Conspiracy, where the wife of Ramesses III, Queen Tie, and a group of officials plotted to kill Ramesses III and place Pentuer, her son, on the throne. 
This conspiracy did lead to the death of Ramesses III, as on his mummy we can see that his throat has been slit. However, despite this, the conspiracy actually failed as Pentua never came to the throne. Many of the sort of complicit officials were burned alive, their ashes scattered in the streets. Pentua, as we've already said, was forced to end his own life, and as for Tia, it is actually unknown what happened to her, but I'm going to guess it probably wasn't good. So as we can see, the film is not exactly great when it comes to historical accuracy. We have people riding on horseback, Egyptian chariots charging into the front lines of the enemy, armour which looks completely different to Egyptian armour, pretty much every soldier wearing a helmet, and people being hung at the gallows. However, on the upside, they have the Hittite chariots as larger and heavier than the Egyptian ones, you know, this is correct, and although Capresh swords would have been more common than the ones shown in the film, the weapons shown here, such as swords, bows and javelins, are also correct. Okay, it's time for the review section. So here I'm going to continue my review on the film from, you know, last time, and then I shall just rate it out of 10 as well. To start with, although I have shown that the battle scenes in this film are <laughs> hit and miss, shall we say, uh, when it comes to accuracy, they are also admittedly very exciting. This does not just refer to the Battle of Gadesh, though admittedly that one is a standout, we also see a later war between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. And I will admit this did keep me invested. And even when it comes to the Ten Plagues of Egypt in the film, they are done in a way that is, you know, quite interesting with the Egyptians trying to rationalise them. So, for instance, they claim that um, red algae sucked all of the oxygen from the water, killing all the fish, and that's why the water turned red. This, in turn, led to frogs jumping out of the water and dying, and without frogs eating the insects, this led to an increase in flies and locusts and so on. This is actually based on a theory by the scientist John S. Marr, but basically, we see the Egyptians trying to explain the plagues away, growing ever more desperate as they do. Honestly, I, I thought this was quite a fun take on the Ten Plagues, if you will. <laughs> on top of this, I like that Moses is not betrayed as an unquestioning follower of God here. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that this is necessarily accurate to the biblical story, but I do feel it sort of comes off as more realistic, which is more fitting for the, the style of film. For instance, when Moses sees people he used to know and like getting swarmed by the ten plagues of Egypt, he has an emotional reaction. He wants God to stop it, and he argues with God. I think this was really good. Further, although as well, many of you listening will know, I'm not a particularly big fan of heavy CGI use, I will admit the CGI here has for the most part, been done pretty well. Like, I think it looks good. They have used it effectively to make large crowds and epic backgrounds. And don't get me wrong, it's fair to say I noticed the CGI more on this watch through, and I will admit it did detract a bit from my enjoyment. But the only reason I noticed this was because I found out that the film was originally 3D, so I was looking out for it. I've seen this film at least two times before, and I'd never really noticed, so... I'm not going to take too many points away from this. On the downside, I did feel that the film relied on people knowing the biblical story. Fortunately, I actually do, so I was never lost, but I feel that's not the case for everyone. For instance, when Moses meets God on the, the kind of like mountainside, and then in the film he just like immediately heads to Egypt to save his people. He has a complete like 180 in his personality. I mean... I know why he did that, because I know the biblical story pretty well. But for someone who doesn't know that story, or maybe just knows bits and pieces of it, this would have, I feel, seemed rather random and a bit out of nowhere. It all really goes back to what I was saying last episode, and also in the introduction to this one. Originally, there was that four-hour cut of the film, and I do think that's the issue here. I feel there needed to be a couple more scenes where we see the change in his personality as he battles with his own conscience and you know, also his struggle as he wouldn't want to leave his family, things like that. 
and don't get me wrong, you do get um, one scene where his wife is pleading with him not to go, but he just seems undeterred. He just goes anyway, and more needed to be done here, let's put it that way. Or in another part, uh, near the beginning of the film, we see a slave being whipped. All we find out about this slave is that he claims to not be able to feel pain. Then, years later, Moses meets this man again and says, Joshua, I remember you. Do you still not feel pain? Again, in this cut, I don't know how he knows this slave's name when he meets him later. I'm pretty sure it's never mentioned, and if it is, it's only mentioned in, you know, briefly in passing. But again, we're supposed to just go, ah, Joshua, that guy from the Bible. And that's kind of like one of the biggest issues with this film. It's hard to know exactly who it's for. The way it's made with all of these cuts that don't quite make sense mean you have to know the biblical story to understand it. But by the same token, this film is hardly accurate to the biblical story. So even if you are in that group who will understand what's going on, there's a very good chance you're not going to really like this film. Further to this, um, again, I feel largely because there wasn't enough time to tell this story. A lot of the character motivations... Um, need more explanation. For instance, for some reason, Ramesses' mother wants Moses dead. My guess is that this is because she sees Moses as a threat to Ramesses taking the throne. You know, because um, Seti I clearly favours Moses over Ramesses. But, but that's also just me coming to my own conclusions. I have no idea if I'm right here. And again, I know I keep saying this, but just a few more scenes to help me make sense of this would have really been useful. And you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe even this four-hour cut wouldn't have improved the film, but I feel like I would like to just watch it just to see if it does. So overall, look, I will say, despite all of these negatives, I actually don't hate this film. In fairness to it, there are some positives here. Aesthetically, I think the film looks really good, and the acting is also, you know, good. I, I think it's done well. There are some exciting scenes, such as the Battle of Gadesh, and there's even some really effective symbolism here, you know, with the swords of Ramesses and Moses. The ones I mentioned in last episode, uh, where Moses' sword has Ramesses written on it, and the sword of Ramesses has Moses written on it. I felt that this was a, a really effective way of showing the friendship of Moses and and uh, Ramesses and how there's a part of each of them that's sort of clinging to it, even though their friendship's becoming more fragmented with time. But on the downside, the film lacks the depth this story needs, relies too much on people knowing the biblical story, and struggles to show the true motivations of the characters. I feel most of these issues could have been resolved with just a longer runtime, but as it is, although Ridley Scott claims there is a four-hour unreleased cut, we do not currently have that. I am still going to give this film a 6 out of 10 because, in all honesty, it is not as bad as some people make it out to be, but it is also a far cry from the film it could have been. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly hope you've enjoyed these last couple of episodes on Exodus Gods and Kings. If you have, why not consider liking, subscribing, leaving a comment? Also, why not subscribe to my new Patreon if you want, um, you know, some extra content, some bonus episodes, some extended episodes? And join me on Monday, where we shall be viewing The Mummy Lives from 1993. I hope you all have an excellent week, and see you then.